This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio, where each week we talk to a musician, artist, author, or other creative Mississippian. I'm your host, Leslie Barker, Arts-Based Community Development Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. Today, I have the incredible privilege of speaking with one of my favorite writers, Jasmine Ward. Her novels, Salvage the Bones and Sing Unburied Sing, both won the National Book Award for Fiction, making her the first woman to win the National Book Award twice. She is a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant, and she is this year's Governor's Arts Awards honoree for excellence in literature. Jasmine, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It is such an honor to talk with you. So we want to go back to the beginning of your story. You grew up in DeLille, Mississippi. So let's start there. Tell us all about growing up in DeLille. Um, you know, it's a, it's a small town. Um, people, the a lot of the people here, um, at least in my community, have um, come from families who have lived here for generations. Um, and it's one of those places where you know, it's sort of stereotypical to say, but everyone does know everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, and I feel like, like there's a real sense of, I think because we have that sense of history, there's also a real sense of community um, here. Uh, when I grew, like growing up here was, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was, beautiful but also hard like all at mm. once um you know it's beautiful because the landscape is really beautiful because there is that strong sense of community here and there's a strong sense of family um and uh you know and so i think that that g- can gives you know uh, children a certain sense of belonging but you know but it was also difficult because i come m- my my family has always been poor you know, and mm-hmm. most of the people in my community, um, you know, most of them, I mean, they're, you know, they're working class, you know, and, and also, um, you know, some of them, you know, have probably uh, been living in poverty for a long time. So like, so that, that's difficult. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know, like it was, it's, it was, um, I mean, it's definitely this place definitely informed me um, about who I was and taught me a lot about the world um, and taught me, um, I think, how began to, to teach me what spoke to me, I think. Um, hmm. And, and I think that this place, you know, I came, I came back here, you know, um, because I was homesick for it and because I wanted to live and work here as an adult. So, you know, at the same time, like, I think that this place, um, you know, continues to inspire me, sometimes continues to frustrate me. Um, (laughs) And, uh, and, and I'm still, and I think my childhood in this place and my like young adulthood in this place, I think that it still uh, informs a lot of what I want, want to write about, I think. Mm. I recently listened to navigate your stars a recent book of yours that came from a commencement speech at Tulane and it's absolutely beautiful and you talk about your passion for words and your reverence for poetry was there something in your surroundings growing up that inspired that well I think I mean I in the past couple of years like in the last three years I've been I've been thinking a lot about um, storytellers mm. and um, oral storytelling. Um, I think in part because I um, there's this photographer um, that I know, El Casimu Kas- Harris. I think that's how you say his name, and he was working on. He's based out of New, was but is based out of New Orleans. Was based out of New Orleans, and he was working on a project about. Um, oral storytellers in the black community and he had approached me about taking part in the project Um, but then I didn't um, 
for multiple reasons. But I think that because he sort of, uh, you know, approached me with that idea, that that made me begin thinking about, um, that made me begin to think about like, w like who are the people in my life from when I was young, um, younger, who told me stories, right? Mm. So before I could read and before I fell in love with like reading stories, I felt like that love of sort of storytelling um, and of like listening to stories and 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 he and being transported from one world to another and embodying somebody else's experience. Mm. I feel like that naturally started with um, the storytellers uh, in my family, right, and in my community who right. told stories when we all gathered together when I was younger, right, and like the first storyteller in my life, of course, was my was my grandmother. Um, and so like the way that she would, um, the way that she would like mimic voices and she would tell mm. you dialogue as if, you know, as if she was the person that she's telling the story about. And, um, and, and then her, like the descriptive language, the figurative language that she would use. I mean, I think that all of, and also her attention to like the rhythm of, of a story, you know, like, mm. I, I think that all of that um, definitely, I carried that into my reading life, you know, and into my yeah. like um, sort of, uh, I carried that with me when I fell in love with reading. So that I think that was the same thing that I appreciated about the books that I read um, and continue to appreciate today, right? And I think that that's one of the reasons that all of that, all of those things are so important to me in my work um, because I'm sort of, uh, you know, because because I, because the stories that my grandmother and other people in my family and my community like told me when I was young, um, you know, in a, in a way, I, I think it was like, you know, like they were teaching me what thrilled me about storytelling and what I valued in storytelling and then later what I would attempt to like mimic in storytelling. If you just tuned in to the Arts Hour, we're talking with this year's Governor's Art Awards honoree for excellence in literature, Jasmine Ward. And if you'd like to join us for the awards, you can watch them on MPB TV on February 19th at 8 p.m. So we were just talking about storytelling and your grandmother and growing up in Delil and, and community. And I'm, I'm so interested in the intersection of community and stories. So do you have any thoughts about how community and stories weave together? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the stories that I heard, or how do I say this? Let me go back. So, the, so when I heard stories, you know, it was mostly at social gatherings. Right. So mm -hmm. like moments, moments of celebration um, when, you know, the people in my family would get together and, you know, gather and, you know, have a party for some reason or other. It didn't necessarily have to be on a holiday um, or a birthday. Um, you know, sometimes we would just get together. And so um, and so we that was when I mostly I think when I heard many of the stories that I heard and, and when, you know, the people in my family and people in my community who, who were very good at storytelling, that's when they told us stories. And so, I don't know, like for me, I feel like it's, um, you know, the act of storytelling, because it often uh, happened in that environment, I think that it, that, um, that I, that for me, like storytelling is aligned with um, like strengthening the bonds of community. I feel mm -hmm. like, and like strengthening the bonds of family because, you know, because it always happened around times when we would get together. Um, and also too, I mean, you know, most of the stories that my grandmother told me and my great grandfather and my great grandmother and, you know, the, the old, my aunt, my great, great aunts, like the, the people in my family, like most of the time, the stories that, that that they told me, I mean, you know, these are 
you know, stories about people in the fa- in the family or in the community who passed on, you know, who died, you know, mm-hmm. or um, and and so, you know, there was a a, a really like strong aspect of, of remembering, you know, like that, like Absolutely. that was also part of the function of the storytelling was to, um, I think, like re- retain some some history you know and um uh so that those people wouldn't be forgotten um Mm. and so i don't know i mean i associate you know storytelling with those things and i think um you know maybe too that's a part of what i'm attempting to accomplish in my work right to um you know to uh to, to remember and tell these histories so that they won't be forgotten, you know, and to, mm. to write about people, um, you know, so that, that so that they won't uh, be forgotten or erased. Um, and also at the same time to strengthen these sort of bonds of family or community, even with people who are not part of my family and who are not part of my community. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, like that's one of the greater purposes of my work is to, um, is to encourage a, a, a kind of empathy that will make, you know, people who aren't members of my family and members of my community feel like they're members of my family and members of my community. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I love hearing you talk about that. I've always believed that if you really, really listen to someone's story, you would really have a hard time not liking them. I think that's such a big part of why all of us as artists do what we do. You know, and as I listen to you talk about the stories throughout your life and the people who told them, I wonder, are there any pieces that you caught or particular stories that you may have heard over and over that that ended up in your work somehow that shows up in your writing? Mm, They haven't. Well, some of those stories did end up in my memoir in men we reaped a lot of them actually uh, um but in my fiction not mm-hmm. as much i think that the w- another one of the ways that that those stories inform my fiction like beyond um teaching me uh what i think a good story is and then uh you know inspiring me to like attempt to sort of emulate that in my work and do that in my work. Because I think that th- that those stories, I think remind me again and again um, that that there's all, that people are complicated, you know, mm-hmm. that, that families are complicated, that communities are, complica- are complicated, that people have history, families have history, communities have history. Um, and even when, um, you know, the type of people that I write about, you know, the type of families that I write about and the type of communities that I write about, like even when those people have been um, sort of flattened and and mm. um, and perhaps like stereotyped in, in how they are portrayed, that, that that is never the case. Like they're never flat, you know, and, and mm. that there's, a, there's a, um, a, a, a richness, I think, to their lives into their stories into their histories and and so i think that like that is how those stories inform my fictional work because when i'm writing the my, about my characters and I'm, when i'm writing about the people that i write about i'm always conscious of the fact that these people have histories that these people have stories that they're mm-hmm. that they are bringing a world each each of the characters that i write about is bringing a specific world to the story that I'm writing um, and that I have to uh, be aware of that. I have to account for that. Mm. I have to work that history into the story um, that I'm attempting to tell. Uh, so I think that that, that that is how those stories um, sort of show up in my, in my fictional work. This is Leslie Barker. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show airs on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5. To access all of our past shows, subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast using your favorite podcasting app.
I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. And today we're talking with author and DeLille, Mississippi native, Jasmine Ward. If you've read Jasmine's novels, you know that Mississippi plays a big part in her work and that the characters live in a place called Bois Sauvage. So Jasmine, tell us about that place. So that place, it's a, so it's a fictionalized version of my hometown, DeLille, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's, um, I think that maybe it's like a fictionalized version of my hometown, maybe from the 1980s, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, I mean, change is the only constant right according to octavia <laughs> butler so um so you know my hometown i mean it, it has changed somewhat you know over the years um especially after um hurricane katrina uh mm-hmm. so the the version of of um you know so that so bois sauvage is like is this sort of idealized fictionalized version of my of my hometown that i think is a bit more is a bit more rural you know than my town has become. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, but, but there are a lot, a lot of similarities between the two. Um, you know, the landscape um, where there's this combination of, of uh, you know, of, of thick, you know, sort of piney woods, right? Um, along with, uh, you know, a marsh and bayou, um, you know, like that's the same, uh, the proximity that it has, you know, to the coast, um, you know, in the, in the beaches, like that's the same, of course, like the makeup of the community there, um, that, that is the same, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, like one of the, the major things, um, or the, one of the major reasons that I, write about the place that I'm from or or that I began writing about the place that I'm from uh, when I first began writing. And this is before I had anything published. I mean, this is um, when I was, uh, you know, trying to write, like when I was taking creative writing classes and uh, and then later, you know, reading a lot on my own and attempting to figure out what I liked about fiction, what worked for me in fiction and then trying to imitate that in my own work. Like one of the things that I wanted to do was write about the kind of people who, well, I wanted to write about a town like like DeLille, like my hometown, um, because I feel like I hadn't seen that perhaps in, mm. in, in fiction, in the fiction that I'd read at that point, right? Um, and I also wanted to write about the the kind of people who could be members of my family or who could be members of my community also because at that point in time, I had not read uh, many stories that ref- that se- that seemed to reflect my experience or you know or just or the experiences of the kind of people that I grew up with and that I lived around. And, um, mm. and so I think that made me feel invisible in a certain respect. Mm. The people that I loved were invisible too. And so I, um, I, I wanted to change that. And, and that's why, you know, when I, from the very beginning, when I, when I first began um, seriously, you know, studying creative writing and, and attempting to, you know, r- write short stories and then novels, like, all the characters I wrote about, you know, they lived in Bois Sauvage. I hadn't named it yet, um, hmm. but they lived in, in that town. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I just think it's a, it's a, uh, 
it's it's a it's a very rich place for me um and it you know it reflects what inspires me and in part what inspired me uh when i was you know when i first began writing and and what you know sort of brought me to storytelling it's so great to hear about the intersection of your hometown and the world that the characters in your books live in you know you mentioned the time in your life when you started really seriously working as a writer. Um, tell us about that time and, and what that looked like and when that happened. So I, I began writing uh, m- mostly poetry when mm-hmm. I was 12 years old. I was in sixth grade um, and I wrote a poem. The first thing I remember writing concretely was a poem for Arbor Day. Um, in, in, in sixth grade, um, and and there was a there and my and the the teachers reacted to it really positively, and I read it I think at like the Arbor Day ceremony that we had, <laughs> and um, hmm. and that was sort of surprising and monumental for me um, because that hadn't happened to me yet, you know, or for me yet, and it, and. And I and as I said, like I, I was a reader from the moment that I knew how to read, right? From the moment that I could, mm-hmm. I, I had to be taught how to read, right? But, but but from the moment that I could read, you know, like I was a reader. I loved reading, but I didn't really think of myself as a writer because it seemed like the work that that writers did in their books was a sort of was magical in a way, and and mm-hmm. it seemed difficult, and I didn't know if I would ever be capable of that, um, and so. I didn't, I wasn't writing stories. I didn't begin by writing stories. I wrote a lot of poetry, bad poetry through my junior high, you know, in high school <laughs> years. And, um, but by the end of my high school years, I, I started, I, att- I began to attempt to write short stories um, and they were terrible. Uh, and <laughs> I went away to college and I didn't take as many, and, and I was very intimidated. You know, I, I went to Stanford um, University for my undergraduate um, degrees, and um, and there was a bit of I experienced a bit of culture shock, um, and I think I also uh, did did not. I wasn't convinced um, of the fact that I deserved to be there, um, and I struggled. I think with with you know, I was the only person from Mississippi <laughs> mm-hmm. for years, right? That went to the school, you know, like my, for my first year there, I didn't meet anybody else who was from mm. Mississippi, period, the whole state. Um, and so I just think that that, uh, wow. that it was hard. And, um, and I sort of like dragged that uh, um, sort of second guessing of myself and that feeling of inferiority that people call it, now people call it, um, they call it a what is it uh, um, imposter syndrome, right? Mm-hmm. So I, like I like I drag that with me throughout my entire undergraduate career, and so it wasn't until the end of my undergrad career, um, you know, I was in my early twenties that I took a few, I took some writing workshops, like I took a, a fiction writing class, and then I, I took a, a poetry writing class, and then I did a tutorial, but I only took three creative writing classes. The whole time that I was at Stanford, and um, uh, so I didn't. So, so I did some work, right, with like with um, beginning to learn how to read like a writer and then write, right, um, at, when I was an undergrad. But but it really wasn't until I graduated, um, and then I moved to and I moved home, and that's when my brother passed away, and so I spent like se- six, seven, seven months at home maybe eight, and then I moved to New York City. And so it wasn't until I moved to New York City and I was working in publishing. Um, and, I, and I guess maybe, I don't know, like that, that longing that I had to tell stories just felt very present, very strong to me after my brother passed. And I was mm. thinking a lot about what I would do with the life that I was given, right? Because oh, I was very yeah. aware of the fact that I wasn't promised time, right? And so mm-hmm. I was thinking a lot about time and about, you know, what one does with their life 
when they're very conscious of time and the fact that we, you know, are not promised the, you know, we're not promised long, long productive lives, right? And so, so I was thinking a lot about those things and, and, and so it was only when I moved to New York City after my brother died that I began to seriously read um, a lot. I had friends who, um, friends of mine who worked in publishing too, who, uh, who'd read more than I had, you know, they were, they were, they were really well read and they would, um, you know, they, they would give me recommendations. They'd be like, you should read this and you should read this and you should read this. And so I would, I would just like read everything that, you know, all, all the suggestions that I got um, from them. And, uh, and, and I began to, to figure out what it meant to like, to read as a writer, right? Before I just read for pleasure and to be transported from one place and out of one experience into another. But when I moved to New York, then I began to read um, to find out, to figure, I began to read uh, with an eye towards like looking at the way that the that beginnings worked and what, how was a writer beginning mm. a story and where did they choose to open a story and, and how did they choose to end a story and, you know, where did they end it and, and, um, you know, and I began thinking about the character and, and I began thinking about like how, how writers write about place and, um, you know, how they use details, right, to create, you know, the world that they're writing about. So, so yeah, so it, it wasn't until my, like, early 20s that I, that um, early to mid-20s uh, that I really began to, like, seriously work at, um, like, work at, I guess, the craft of, of, of writing. So when you were writing, when you were far away from home, was that a different experience? Did the place that you grew up look different from a distance than it does up close? Mm, it did. I think, you know, I spent, how long? Let me think. Basically from when I was 18. I spent around 12 years. Hmm in other in uh, living in other places you know so this was new york city this was um this was michigan this was san francisco was palo alto california um so i i i I spent a long like when i seriously began learning um like studying writing uh and 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 practicing, you know, and failing, and 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 doing it again. I was out in the world, and I think that that did allow me to. I don't know that to, to to see differently, you know. Perhaps mm-hmm. I think I feel like it widened my lens a little bit, um, so that. Um, I don't know, so that I, uh, I was able to not look, not see beyond individual stories because individual stories and telling individual stories are very important to me. But I think that being in a different place enabled me to, um, to perhaps see uh, more clearly see how, or better see how, or understand how individuals are connected and how you know families are connected and 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 how communities are connected um Mm -hmm. uh and then how they're not connected um so yeah so i do i do think that distance helped my vision to evolve i think This is Leslie Barker. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show airs on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5. To access all of our past shows, subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson. 
president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. And today we're talking with author Jasmine Ward. And before the break, we were talking a lot about your writing, of course, but I also want to talk to you about education. You are a teacher at Tulane, and just through reading essays and listening to speeches that you've made, uh, it's so clear that education has been just such a foundation in your life. So tell us a little bit about what education has meant to you. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think that when I, when I was growing up, that the way that my, that the people in my family sort of talked about education um, was that it would provide a way out. You know, mm-hmm. and, and basically that it was a way because my parents always wanted their children to, um, you know, to have it, e- to have an easier time of it than they did. Um, I, I, you know, my dad, uh, you know, he worked a lot of my dad was working class. He worked a lot of like factory jobs um, when I was growing up. My mom uh, was also working class. She worked as a housekeeper for many many years um now she doesn't but but throughout my high school you know and into college years that's what she did she worked as a housekeeper and so um and so and my my parents wanted more than that you know for their kids as many parents do right and so when so when I was little like from the very beginning my mom always told me you're going to college, like you're going to go to college. And that wasn't a thing that had been done in my family. I mean, my, you know, half, I think half of my, well, I think less than what, no, my mom, there are seven uh, siblings in my mom's family. And I think four of them graduated from high school. Um, I think three, I think those four got some college education after that. Uh, but I don't think that any of them earned degrees. Um, the, you know, the, her other three siblings did not graduate from high school. Um, and so, and, and then my grandmother, she had a, the school that she went to went up to the sixth or seventh grade. I'm having problems remembering right now. Um, so people in my family had not had access to education before right Mm -hmm. and and really there was nothing about our financial situation (laughs) you know when I was growing up that um I don't know that would like that would make uh, them assume that it would be easy for me to get to college I mean my parents they knew that they would not have the money to pay for me to go to school but I guess they just figured you know like we're going to make a way out of no way. You are going to go to college because, you know, my parents just, they wanted more for us. And, and, and for them, you know, what they taught me was that education was the way to do that, right? The education mm-hmm. was the way to like, li- to, uh, you know, sort of fight your way out of, um, you know, all of these sort of endless cycles that we had been stuck in for generations. Um, and, I think that that's a very important, I think education is a very important component to that, you know, to, um, to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, to fighting your way out of, um, you know, poverty. Uh, But I think that it's one part of the equation, you know, like I think that it's it's one component of, or one aspect um, of, you know, of, 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 of escaping poverty, um, you know, but, 
I, I feel like, you know, other things have to align too. You have to be lucky. You have to work hard. You have to, mm-hmm. you know, there, there have to be other people and institutions have to make opportunities available for you. Like, you know, they mm-hmm. have to open those opportunities um, to you. Uh, and, um, and so I think that there's a whole, you know, there's a whole array of, 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 of things that have to happen in order, you know, for, for, you know, for people to be able to sort of realize their dreams, but, um, but, you know, those, those all that, that array of things, it doesn't happen for everybody, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that education is really important, but, but, but again, like, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a component of, uh, of other things and, you know, and I teach now, right. But mm-hmm. I mean, I think about like my education um, and my, and specifically my education, in, like writing. And I, I learned a lot in school and, and, and I'm not only talking about, um, you know, my undergraduate years when I studied at Stanford, but I'm also talking about, um, you know, I, I, I earned my MFA at the University of Michigan at, at Ann Arbor, you know, my master's in fine arts and fiction um, and in creative writing. And then um, afterwards, a couple years after I finished that program, then I, um, I got a Stegner Fellowship. So I went back to Stanford for the Stegner Fellowship where I again mm-hmm. studied um, creative writing like in the classroom. So like, so, uh, so creative writing education has been really important to me in my life, but I, but I know too that, um, that again, that, I mean, it, it has uh, informed much of my evolution as a writer, but that has not been but there are other things I think that have also contributed to my evolution as a writer. Um, mm. You know, the reading that I do outside of class, the writing that I do, that I have done outside of the classroom, the life experiences that I've had, you know, outside of, you know, the, the, the classroom, like all of those things, I think, um, you know, and then, and then of course, like, I don't know, certain like aspects of my own personal life, right? That have forced me to grow and evolve um, uh, and hopefully, you know, sort of change for the better as a human being. Um, those two have been important, I think, to my, um, to my like evolution as a, as a writer. But, but, I, but, I, but I, I have to say like, I, I've taken a really traditional route to get to the mm. place where I am, right? Because I did, I relied a lot on school. Um, to get there but that was the route for me you know like that that was the basically the only way that I could I mean (laughs) that I could make that I could mm, that I could sort of fight my way to this to the reality that I'm living now Um, you know I I like as I said as I said earlier like my nobody in my family my, my family was not independently wealthy I didn't have you know family to like support me you know, uh, so that I wouldn't have to work so I could just write. I didn't have family to, you know, family funds to like support me so that I could work a job where I wasn't perhaps earning that much money and then uh, then write on the side. Like, I just, I didn't have that safety net. Um, so, so, so uh, for me, getting an MFA, you know, and, and then, and then afterwards, like applying for, for fellowships, um, you know, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, getting scholarships when I went to school, but then also taking out loans. Like I had to do all those things in order to, um, you know, in order to study what I wanted to study and in order to learn what I wanted to learn. So I could, so I could one day get here to this place. Um, hmm. But that was the path that worked for me. And it's not the path that works for everybody. Um, but that, that is what I needed in order to, um, to, uh, you know, to grow uh, into the person, into the writer, you know, that I am uh, now. Before we reach the end of the show, I want to make sure to ask you, is there anything that you're working on now or that's coming up that you're looking forward to that you'd like to tell us about? So I, (laughs) (laughs) I have been working on the same novel for a number of years now. Um, it feels like a really long time. It's probably been around four, five years, maybe six years. It just feels like I've been working on it for a lot longer. Um, but I'm 
currently working on a novel set in 1835 and it is about an enslaved woman who is sold south from South Carolina and walked, marched to New Orleans and then sold in the slave markets in New Orleans and then she goes to a, to a sugarcane plantation. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's unlike anything that I've ever written before. Uh, it's really difficult. Um, it takes, it, it is taking a lot of research. You know, I, I, I've been researching the entire, I mean, I think basically like the first two years I was working on the book, I just read. I didn't even write anything because I couldn't because I didn't know anything. Um, and so I, I just read. Um, and then after two years of reading, then I started writing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's unlike anything that I've, that I've ever written. Um, uh, but, and not only because it's taking place in 1835 and because, but I think also because it's about an enslaved person, right? Mm. And so it, it, it was really difficult for me in the beginning of the book to figure out how to write about someone who had been robbed of physical agency. So, so, so mm. someone whose physical agency had been stolen from them. How do you write about that person? Um, like, what do they do? What do they do when they can't do anything? You know, like when they're mm-hmm. literally shackled and chained and restrained and all of their movements are limited and directed. How, uh, what do they do? Like, it's, it's, it's very difficult to write about a character like that because one of the, the, one of the things that comes up often in creative writing classes um, and creative writing workshops is like is 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 about the is about plot right and how plot should be character driven and it should not just be about what happens to a character but what a character makes happen right and and, and how a character sort of uh, changes things and does things to to make the story move forward right and that's really hard to do <laughs> when your character is mm. chained, when your character is bound, when your character can't, w- when your character is limited in their actions because of what had, because of how others are constraining them, right? And treating them like an animal. Uh, so I, so that was a really big struggle when I first began working on it. Um, at, I think I have a handle on it now. I am, how many pages in? I'm around 200 pages into the rough draft. Um, I probably have around 60 more to go, you know, so I'm in the, the last third of the book. This is where it gets really hard <laughs> when you're writing rough draft because you have to write a good ending. You know, like mm-hmm. you have there, you have a lot of like narrative balls that you are juggling, and you have to uh, catch all of them. You know, you you have to like at this point you realize, oh no, like all these all these characters have character arcs, and I have to resolve all of these character arcs uh, in a satisfactory way. You know, like I like, and I have to do that for each of these characters. Um, and still, you know, and still have to be conscious of like the plot and, Mm -hmm. of uh, you know, uh, resolving the plot in a way that's, that will feel satisfactory for the reader. So it gets really hot. Like the last third of the book is, is, is rough. Um, but, um, but I love it and I'm excited and it's, and I struggle every day with it. I mean, I, you know, I work on it, you know, for at least two hours, five days a week, um, so, you know, so it's, it's, it's a struggle every day. Um, but, um, but I'm so excited that I'm, that I'm nearing the end of this rough draft. Um, and, uh, and of course I still have a ton of work to do to it. Right. So, because once I've finished the rough draft, then I have to go back in and I have to revise again and again and again and again and again and again, like I'll end up revising 15 to 20 times at least, mm. uh, you know, by the time every it's all said and done, you know, before it sees the world, 
I'll probably revise 50, I'll easily revise 15 times. It's probable, you know, that that number will be closer to like to 20. Um, hmm. So yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, <laughs> near the beginning of the process, but, um, but I don't know, like I'm, I'm beginning to get excited uh, because I can see the endings off in the distance. Uh, hmm. And I, I know I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to get there in the next two months, hopefully. Uh, so that is what I'm working on right now. Um, I'm under contract for that book. And then after that, I, uh, will actually write a middle grade slash YA book. Um, oh, wow. It's with us with that is a project that I've probably secretly wanted to do in my heart of hearts since I was a kid, because I love the stories that I read, but I just, I, I felt very invisible, you know, like I love mm. reading garden but <laughs> but you know yeah. I was very invisible in that story I, I love yeah. being roll of thunder hear my cry but I was also invisible there too you know um so so yeah so I'm very excited to to, to work on that um as well but that that is also a little bit farther off on the horizon you know I, I probably begin that in the next I don't know two uh year and a half probably be I'll probably begin that book in like a year and a half well, I can't wait to read both of those books. But in the meantime, if someone hasn't read any of your books, where would you tell them to start? What should they read first? Uh, I don't know. I guess the easy answer to that question would be they should start at the beginning. You could start with my first novel, Where the Line Bleeds. I mean, it's not my best work, uh, you know, because I wrote it in my, oh, geez, in my mid, mid, mid 20s, mid to late 20s. Um, I was very young and I was figuring out how to write a novel as I wrote it, um, you know, as I wrote that first novel, but, but it is the beginning, you know, and, and it sort of, uh, you know, sort of introduces Bois Sauvage, you know, the place that I write about and the kind of people that I write about. Um, and, and, um, and, and I feel like it's compelling, you know, I still love those characters in that book. I, I think that I could have done a, that right now as the writer that I am now, I could, I could have done better by them. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, that's just because I've grown and evolved as a, as a, as a writer. This is Leslie Barker. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show airs on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at five. To access all of our past shows, subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app.